Hi, everyone, and welcome. We are happy to have you join us for part two of our webinar series, Childhood Obesity Research Across Borders, the Physical Environment. My name is Karen Hilliard from the INCOR Coordinating Center, and I'll be facilitating today's presentation. Today's Connect and Explore webinar will spotlight childhood obesity across the US and Latin America, and will focus on the physical environment. After the presentations, we'll have time for a Q&A with the speakers, followed by some announcements from INCOR and a brief survey for all of you. Today's speakers all took part in an NIH Fogarty Center workshop, Childhood Obesity Prevention Across Borders, the Promise of US-Latin American Research Collaboration. They have a special issue that was recently released in Obesity Reviews, and you can find a link to that in the chat. Let me go ahead and introduce our panel to you right now. Today we have Abby King from the Stanford University School of Medicine, Olga Lucia Sarmiento from the Universidad de los Andes, Maria Alejandra Rubio, also from the Universidad de los Andes, Ana Clara Duran from the University of Sao Paulo, and Lindsay Smith Taylor from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. If you have a question for our speakers during the webinar, please write it using the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen. If you need technical assistance during the webinar, please let us know using the chat box. And if you're having any trouble logging into the webinar, you can email us at incore at fhi360.org, um, also uh, in, the, in the chat and on the slide right now, and we will work with you to resolve the problem. Um, if you have, if you want to ask a question, um, again, use the Q&A box and use the chat for any technical issues. We will also be live tweeting during, uh, during this webinar. Um, and if you're on Twitter, we encourage you to join the conversation by using the hashtag ConnectExplore and following us at Incor on Twitter. Um, the Incor INCOR and the Fogarty International Center are releasing a new fact sheet today, also we wanted to let you know, that provides an overview of the special issue and highlights the themes of the articles. It is available on the INCOR website. Now, to start things off, we'd like to open up with a couple of poll questions, and you can submit your answer directly on the screen. Our first question for you today is, where do you work? The US, Latin America, or elsewhere? And next question is, what topics you work on? Whether, and you can check all that apply. It's multiple choice, nutrition, physical activity, clinical work, social sciences, policy, programs, uh, any of those. Please check as many as apply. I'm not sure if we are seeing the poll questions right now. We may need to, to activate those, or we may be having a little Zoom glitch. We'll try it again. All right, so everybody is voting. We'll give just a, uh, or, or selecting their answers. We'll give just a moment or two here for everybody to respond. Three, two, and one. All right, if we could go ahead and share the results here. All right, excellent. And so we can see here that a uh, majority of the attendees on today's webinar work in the US, but we also have a number of folks who work in Latin America or elsewhere. Um, and also a majority of folks working in the area of nutrition, but also uh, a, a majority working on um, physical activity issues as well. Um, and a, lot of distribution all across the the running the gamut across clinical work, social sciences, policy, and programs. All right. 
Very good. Well, thank you for letting us know who you are and um, giving us giving us a little bit of information. Our spotlight today is childhood obesity research across borders, the physical environment. And I am now pleased to turn it over to Dr. Abby King. Thanks so much, Karen. Uh, I really appreciate it. And now I am going to hopefully drive the slides. <laughs> Welcome everybody. Um, I'm going to uh, be presenting around a few things briefly. Uh, first of all, um, to briefly discuss several of the goals of the Fogarty workshop that you've been hearing about. Um, then I'll highlight just briefly some of the cutting edge methods to advance this area, including participatory action methods. And finally, I'll be describing a particular form of by the people citizen science that we think can well promote both physical activity and healthy eating on both sides of the border. So one of the major problems that really came up quite clearly during the workshop had to do with the silos that exist between physical activity and nutrition researchers and in part due to the academic training programs that, that may not sufficiently emphasize both health behaviors in this area. And we've also found that different regions tend to emphasize different aspects of the obesity prevention equation. For example, in Latin America, there's been wonderful work focusing on nutrition policy interventions with less focus on physical activity. Uh, in the US, we've had difficulties often getting policy level interventions activated for both of these important health behaviors. So in terms of solutions, we, we strongly believe that cross-border researchers can really learn so much from one another uh, through explicitly exploring behavioral synergies between physical activity and dietary change, um, which when combined can really result in more cost and time efficient interventions, and also can uncover potential synergistic or even interference effects when combining these two health behaviors. And I'd like to show you just one example of that in one of our studies called the COM trial, where we were testing how best to combine dietary and physical activity advice to optimize both behaviors, looking at sequential versus simultaneous delivery of advice and support via phone in 200 adults who weren't meeting guidelines for either of these health behaviors. We found that actually for things like fruits and vegetable consumption, that in fact, there were no differences in terms of whether you started with physical activity first and add a diet or diet first, uh, and then adding physical activity or doing both together. And the same was true when looking at percent of calories from saturated fat, all groups are able to do a good job of reducing that. However, when we came to, um, trying to change physical activity, we found that in fact, if people started with the diet intervention first, they never really got uh, traction in terms of being able to increase their physical activity. So I think these are the kinds of areas that really need further exploration. So one way to build synergies is to have physical activity and dietary expertise on your research team or through cross team collaborations, both within and across countries and borders. So turning to just some of the cutting edge methods that were highlighted in the supplement, um, there's a great review on system science. There's also some excellent information on implementation science in the supplement. And finally, there's some information on participatory action or citizen science, which is what I'm gonna be focusing on a little bit here in providing an example of that called our voice. So our voice is a citizen science approach that empowers residents to assess and advocate for healthier neighborhoods and communities with local decision makers and facilitators who can be trained in how to do this can come from almost any kind of sector, community organizations, researchers, businesses, or residents themselves. So our voice starts with an easy to use mobile app 
called the Neighborhood Discovery Tool that can be used by residents irrespective of tech literacy or language to assess community features that either promote or hinder active and healthy living. It's currently in 13 languages and growing. And the tool is used to collect neighborhood information via GPS route tracking and geotagged photos and audio or text narratives. And the users who have successfully used the app have ranged in age from ages nine to over 95 years old. And the app is used to collect anonymized, de-identified data. So that this kind of tool generates spatially tagged, multi-component data and integrated visualizations that can be quite useful, um, both for the community as well as for researchers. So this tool is a gateway to the four-step Our Voice community engagement process. So after the data are collected, residents come together to discuss and prioritize their data. They then learn how to advocate for change with local decision makers. Um, and we've had a number of proven successes, both uh, north and south of the border uh, in using um, these kind, this kind of tool and low income uh, communities is supporting both physical activity and healthy food access, including things like infrastructure repair or additions supporting local walkability, increased access to healthy foods, and safer and activity supportive parks and recreational spaces. So the um, model or method has been used in eight sectors or settings so far. And for example, uh, it's been used up here in the San Francisco Bay Area in an intergenerational neighborhood called North Fair Oaks, which is a low income Latino neighborhood here. And we had 20 adolescents and older adult citizen scientists participating. And they were very successful in a number of things, including uh, alerting waste management authorities about illegal dumping of trash and other items that blocked their sidewalks, making it difficult to walk. They helped to form a community advisory board to provide ongoing guidance on the best practices to improve community health. They developed a bilingual community resource guide that included contact details for, for their local safety and service providers. And finally, they were able to involve the staff from the nearby health center to help to encourage program sustainability. So adding our voice um, to other programs has also been looked at. And for instance, um, it's been added to enhance the efficacy and participation rates for safe routes to school programs, which are quite popular here in the US and in many other places. Um, the target city or town was Gilroy, California, the garlic capital of the world, as they like to think of themselves, uh, largely farmland and suburban areas in Gilroy, and the majority of Gilroy residents are Latino. So um, we went ahead and had two elementary schools in the Gilroy public school system, uh, the elementary school receiving the standard Safe Roots program plus our voice um, held twice as many school safe routes engagement events versus the elementary school just re, uh, receiving the safe routes alone program. And this difference grew in the subsequent school year. The Safe Routes Plus Our Voice School also were able to add additional school bike racks um, to their school. And they had one year walking and biking rates that were twice that of the Safe Routes Alone School. So we've gone global with this kind of citizen science research. Uh, our voice is now in over 20 countries spanning six continents with a major goal focusing on dynamic exchange of data, measures and learnings to advance global health equity. I've put in turquoise some of the countries uh, south of the border um, that have been uh, engaged successfully in our voice and Olga Lucia will be commenting a bit on, on that. Um, so one example um, of this kind of partnership has been in Cuernavaca, Mexico, with a partnership between the Instituto Nacional de Salud Pública and Stanford. 
Um, the target was four economically diverse neighborhoods and involved both adolescents and adults as citizen scientists. And because there was limited access to decision makers, the local solution really focused on social mobilization of the neighborhoods, leading to formation of a citizen coalition to increase neighborhood cohesion, development of a resident driven campaign to curb leash and clean up after stray dogs, which made it difficult to walk safely and development of a better understanding about neighborhood graffiti through intergenerational discussions and decision-making. So in summary, this growing body of participatory research shows that residents from youth through older adults can gather and analyze data around local community features that influence healthy living and quality of life and learn how to successfully advocate for healthier neighborhoods communities and environments. And this can Im improve upstream factors impacting key health behaviors for everyone to advance health equity. And their role as positive change agents also can enhance personal and group efficacy, social cohesion, and actually lead to future advocacy efforts that we call ripple effects. And finally, it offers a great platform, we think, for cross-cultural learnings and collaborations. So I'd like to thank you very much. And now I'm, I'm delighted to be able to turn over um, the microphone to Olga Lucia and Maria Alejandra. Thank you. Thank you, Abby. And thank you to NCOR for organizing this um, event to learn more about prevention of obesity across borders for Latino children, Latino youth. So um, our talk is gonna be concentrated on the built environment in programs to promote physical activity among Latino children and youth living both in the United States and in Latin America. And I will be presented, presenting with Maria Alejandra Ruy. Next, please. Okay, so first of all, I want to acknowledge the transdisciplinary team of this project. And I also want to acknowledge again that it was important that uh, in the year 2019, the US Center for Global Health Studies of Fogarty International brought together US and Latin American scientists researching childhood obesity prevention. And this paper and all these papers that you have seen in this series are part of this workshop. Next. Next, and next. So to prevent obesity among Latino youth in the United States and in Latin America, it is necessary to understand the specific context and the interplay of physical activity and the built environment. And here in these pictures, you see some examples of the built environment for promoting physical activity among children. Now to advance the for some reason, I'm not seeing my, okay, yeah. So now, um, to advance research for obesity prevention, we must acknowledge that children's and youth physical activity behaviors are embedded in social, cultural, and built environment contexts. Therefore, to promote physical activity, we must ensure supportive environments that provide children and families with culturally relevant opportunities and infrastructures for free play, like you see in the pictures, a structure and unstructured outdoor physical activity, and active transport related behavior. Behaviors. Now, accomplishing this will require a comprehensive interdisciplinary research and policy agenda that should be cognizant of the complex interplay of active behaviors and built environment. And we saw a little bit of that from Ivy's presentation. We need to move uh, beyond uh, traditional methods. Next, please. In this context, to advance the research agenda on the built environment and physical activity for obesity prevention in Latin America among Latino youth in, uh, in the United States and in Latin America, we propose to identify environmental indicators to inform, design, and also lead interventions uh, that could change a policy. We also propose 
to um, interdisciplinary methodological approaches and tools for the study of the complex association between built environment and the physical activity. And we also uh, are illustrating some of these methods through different built environment programs in both the US and in Latin America. Next, please. So um, our research is focused on the built environment. Uh, many of you know the built environment, but what we refer in this paper and I, what I will be illustrating is this physical environment that provides the setting for children and youth, like poor parks, the urban form, schools, neighborhoods, and very importantly, the streets also. So beyond its physical uh, features, as you can see in this picture, built environment has to be aligned with local social cultural norms, values and dynamics. And therefore we are advocating for the use of interdisciplinary approaches, which can lead to a better understanding of the activity enhancing or activity limiting places in the built environment and how they are related with aspects of the individual level and the social environment. Next. So in this figure, I want to underscore the importance of the complex methodological approach using interdisciplinary mixed methods to better understand physical activity and built environment. So first, I'm going to start with the spatial analysis to assess the spatial configuration and composition of the built environment, including, for instance, the urban form, traffic data, crime, transport access, indicators on walkability and bikeability, all of these important for children and youth. Also on the bottom, you see social network analysis. So we also want to uh, bring attention to social network analysis, which is a tool to integrate the social environment constructs into the built environment research. Because understanding and using the inherent social structures of children and adolescents may help us to better understand the mechanisms by which built environment interventions could work. And additionally, uh, as Ivy already mentioned, we also want to bring attention to our voice citizen science, citizen science by the people, which allows to uh, have citizens to engage on research activities and collect data from their environment. They analyze their data, they get empowered by citizen science, and they identify priorities and then they advocate for potential solutions with relevant local decision makers. Next, please. Thank you. So now I'm going to start uh, elaborating a little bit of what we have for the spatial analysis. So as cities where Latino and Latin American youth live continue to expand and densify, quantifying the spatial configuration and accurately projecting their future dynamics becomes critical for physical activity and obesity prevention. Um, so we want to underscore the importance of advances in geospatial analysis and remote sensing, which offer a unique opportunity for comparable urban landscape, street design metrics, green space metrics, and blue space metrics. And this is what you are seeing in this picture, in these uh, figures, that we could use these data to compare um, what we are seeing in Latin America and in the US, because we can link these data with survey data and then understand better the relationship of the built environment and physical activity behaviors among children and adolescents. For example, through the uh, Salurval project, Salud Urbana in America Latina, we created many of these indicators at different scales, at the city scale, at the neighborhood scale, from at least 12 countries. And this uh, has been also done in the US. And then we can compare those results from the US and from Latin America and assess different thresholds. To what extent, for instance, cities that are more compact are more related with less uh, obesity and more physical activity behaviors? Or what are the, the, the thresholds that we see for a sprawl or for a street density? Next. Also, to better understand the built environment. Next one, please. 
I, I show you the spatial configuration, some of these um, new metrics that we can have from open sources and that can help us to better understand the relationship of physical activity and built environment, but also to better understand the interplay of built environment and physical activity. We also think that we have to move beyond an analysis of the spatial patterns of activities that are sometimes organized in a two dimensional space. And we need to better understand the interplay play of economic, social, cultural, environmental, and political administrative dynamics. In this context, as, as Avi already said, citizen science is a unique tool. So for instance, in the city of Bogota, we use this uh, methodology, we use citizen science by the people to better understand barriers and facilitators at the school level, both for the food environment and the physical activity environment where the children are having physical activity classes. And they identify those barriers and those facilitators for having a more healthy environment at the school level. They also share that information with local stakeholders and they propose solutions. But they also very importantly recognize that they are very important um, uh, agents for promoting a healthy environment in their schools. Next. Now here we have an example of uh, how we can use social network analysis because um, this tool allows us to better understand the friendship networks, the, the, the social structure that we might find in different um, settings like here classrooms. So for instance, in Bogota, what we conducted was a study to promote physical activity during recess time among uh, children. And here we have the results from time zero to time one. So we saw an increase in physical activity behaviors, but we also saw that after the intervention of the recess time plus SMS, there was an increase of cohesion on the structure and the network structure of um, these of the children in these uh, classrooms. So basically what social network uh, is analysis is helping us is to better understand the friendship, the cohesion as a co-benefit, but also this co-benefit in this intervention could be a mechanism by which physical activity interventions are more sustainable. Now Maria Alejandra is going to illustrate some other examples. Thank you, Olga Lucia. Hi, everyone. I am pleased to share with you that aligned to what Olga Lucia presented, we reviewed initiatives in the United States and Latin America that have implemented built environment interventions to promote physical activity among youth. And we built maps to illustrate the availability of programs per region. We found that play street initiatives are more prevalent in Latin America than in US. Play street is the most abundant public space, which are streets. Play streets are generally community-based initiatives aimed at addressing safety concerns, as well as inequality and opportunities for other play for children that may not have a park, green space, or shared play spaces in walking distance to their home. Play streets are residential streets, temporarily closed to automobile traffic, so children and their families can safely play and engage with their community. Generally, the activities are agreed among community members and include diverse games or unstructured physical activity. We reviewed cases in Miami, United States, and Santiago, Chile. At each location, the address safety concerns limiting the outdoor play were different. In the US, the limited walkability. In Chile, the crime. And we found that these programs increased physical activity among children, improved civic engagement, and social cohesion in the neighborhood, showing that are malleable to context specific needs and local sociocultural aspects. However, research has been limited. Next, please. Active travel to school programs are aimed at promoting playful, safe, active commuting to school. The map shows that active school transit programs are more prevalent in the United States, where the prevalence of active travel to school is very low compared to Latin America. And as children are the most vulnerable pedestrians and bicyclists, active travel to school programs focus on safety, infrastructure, and education aspects to foster independent mobility, civic engagement, and environmental awareness. 
Fortunately, Abby already reviewed some programs uh, from California. Next, please, just to conclude, we want to underscore that the programs targeting the built environment to promote physical activity in addition to transforming the built environment must impact the social structures where the Latino and Latin America youth are embedded. Therefore, to increase active behaviors, the intervention must also include components to acknowledge and transform parents' and youth perceptions towards built environment features. And finally, any program aiming to promote physical activity as a means to address childhood obesity necessarily requires to be implemented along with similar strategies trying to provide healthy food environments. Um, thank you for listening, and I am pleased to turn the microphones over to Anna Clara and Lindsay. We also are very grateful to our funding. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm sorry. I'm having a little bit of phones here. Okay. Um, can I start? Can you guys hear me? Okay. Hear you. So, okay, great. Um, so, uh, thank you, Alexandra, for um, this very good, along with Abby and Olga, uh, introduction to our talk. So, should I pass or will Amanda pass our um, slides? Uh, Clara, you should have um, control of the screen now. Just click one. All right, cool. Okay, cool. Let me see how I... I don't know if I do it, well. um. Okay, I think now. Okay, I got it. It's going too fast. I'm very sorry. I guess. Uh, can you also see me? I'm like, my camera is on actually. Maybe something wrong with my camera. Um, so, okay. So just so we are not um, delayed here. So I'd like to uh, talk about food environment solutions for childhood obesity in Latin America and Latinos in the US. This work was um, led by myself and Lindsay Taylor, who will be speaking after me, and with a collaboration with a lot of good partners who will be talking about in the end of the presentation. Um, first, uh, children live in the US, uh, Latino heritage in the US, and children live in Latin America are experiencing growing take of ultra processed foods and beverages. For instance, here I bring the data from the in Haines from 09 to 2014. That shows that kids as young as two are eating more than half of their calories of their diet is coming from ultra processed foods. Well, um, for those who are not aware of what ultra processed foods are, they are basically foods that are uh, made full of additives, um, uh, sugar, salt, fat. And for instance, here I have a few examples of like noodles, step noodles, uh, cookies, crackers. Uh, snacks, uh, many of the canned um, foods and uh, foods ready to eat. So this is a, a uh, reality for kids in many, many countries of the world and especially uh, important in a few countries in, the, in Latin America, such as Chile, Mexico, and to a, low, to a lesser um, extent, Brazil, and very much in the US. And although uh, Mexican Americans and Hispanics still have a uh, lower consumption of ultra processed foods when compared with non Hispanic whites and non Hispanic blacks in the US, acculturation is, has been associated with greater consumption of those foods among these groups. Therefore, um, this gap should uh, be not as, uh, as big as, as time goes by, especially in the second and third generations of uh, Latinos in the US. And here I'm talking mostly about kids many times. Um, there is a growing body of evidence showing the, the association between the consumption of ultra processed foods and obesity 
And now, uh, more recently, also, there's have been a lot of information on the association with child obesity as well. Here I present different data from two cohorts, one in Brazil and the other one was a recent study, recently published study in, in, in the UK that followed kids for 21 years and um, has shown that um, yes, ultra-processed food consumption was associated with only not only with BMI, but also total body fat and um, fat mass in index. So this is a problem, a problem that uh, requires a systemic solution. Uh, in our paper, and we have focused on uh, on how the food environment can contribute to the problem and how we can, uh, and which are the solutions that, uh, in the US, in Latin America, and how these um, solutions can be exchanged across borders and how we can learn with, um, with uh, folks from different places. Well, uh, when we're talking about systemic food environment problems, like uh, it's a problem about, of, for instance, affordability and healthy foods not, not always are cheaper than healthy foods. Uh, food labeling uh, is many times very confusing, like uh, especially with lots of claims such as fat-free, sugar-free, 100% vitamin C uh, in unhealthy foods, uh, which uh, evidence from Brazil and other countries in Latin America in the US has shown that uh, uh, ultra-processed foods are more likely to carry those healthy and nutrition claims than non-ultra-processed foods. Uh, as well with, with marketing, which especially when they are targeted at children, um, you probably all are very aware of those in TV, in cartoons, on the internet, YouTube, and on food packages. Um, and also in institutions, for instance, in schools. Uh, this is a, a school meal from the United States with chocolate milk um, as part of the, the, the meal, as well as um, uh, fries and um, ketchup, which are all um, mostly likely which are processed foods. Um, so in a way to systematize the information available on how the food environment are and to compare them across borders, Latin America and with um, children living in the U Latino heritage living in the US, we have used the informus structure, which divides uh, the, the, the food environment in um, seven domains. Uh, so here, and also um, show, no, it also helps us to understand which are the solutions for each one of those domains of the food environment. Uh, Evans also has been showing very strong uh, the importance of policy in solving these problems. When I'm talking about policy, I'm talking about, uh, oops, sorry. When I'm talking about policy, I'm talking about um, policies that target Many of those um, examples that I showed before, like uh, increasing the price of the processed foods and other unhealthy foods, uh, restricting um, marketing and uh, making labels more easy, easier to understand for the consumer at the point of decision making at the store. Um, and why policy and not individual level interventions? They are not like a one or other, but many times, but policies can affect a uh, lot uh, whole populations rather than just one by one. And also the, the, the main goal of the policy is not to make people make decisions and make decisions for themselves, but also but mainly to make the, the easy decision, the healthy decision. The healthy decision be the default. So um, as um, uh, Olga and Alejandra were saying, were saying before, making not only the good environment healthier, but also the food environment healthier. So here we'd like to just speak about one of those domains, which is going to be marketing. Why marketing? Because marketing is everywhere. Marketing is very much targeted at children and it's on TVs, it's on movies, on celebrities, um, packages with car cartoon characters, uh, awards, prize as well now, you more and more, you can see them in social media, uh, both inside uh, YouTube cartoons and or, uh, programs directed to children, but also in, in gen the general like uh, social media, such as Instagram and Facebook. Um, in the US, marketing is targeted. We hear, I bring information about um, from the Red Center, which is one of the 
our co-authors is, is a researcher there and, and, and um, share with us a lot of, help us uh, build this uh, presentation, which is Jennifer. Uh, she um, is here, you can see that um, children of Spanish uh, eggs, two thirds of the eggs in Spanish language TV tend to promote fast food, candy, sugar drinks and snacks. Uh, here an example of one very uh, specific ad to Tostitos, which was uh, targeted at the Hispanics in the US, as well as McDonald's. Um, here I bring uh, Cha Chapolin, El Chapolin Colorado, which in Portuguese we call Chapolin Colorado. Uh, he is a very known uh, character across all Latin America and within you, you, Hispanics live in the US and yeah, no, no surprise that McDonald's have used um, Chapolin for the ads. Um, by looking at the, how the, the expenses uh, on of those most target fast food, they tend to spend more on Spanish language TV than in other. Um, and here I present a little, a few more uh, examples and since we are going to have to the, uh, since we're going to have to just do, like, I'm sorry, like, um, um, thank you, Amanda. Like, we just, sorry, I was talking about like the time. Like, I think we're kind of going over time, sorry. So, since in a way, like, putting marketing also is also very much in, uh, interlinked with the environment. I present here, um, a few instances where ads, those same ads are not only targeted at children in other situations, but also in, in including youth sports and in general sports. For instance, here, I think you're all very aware of the impact that, that the simple uh, agua and not coke that uh, Cristiano Ronaldo said during the UEFA uh, has, as you can see, I made a, like a disaster into the uh, um, the, the shareholder for the shareholders of Coke. Now I'm going to pass to Lindsay. I'm so sorry for um, passing it a bit long. That's fine. No worries. Thanks, Anna Clara. So this is a map to show where we currently see food policies, and what you'll notice is that most policies that have been implemented have been voluntary. Um, industry-led regulations. And so this is one of the reasons why we don't have a very strong understanding to date of how and how much food policies impact the food environment and lead to changes in um, obesity and health outcomes. One is just because of a lack of policies um, that have been implemented. And the second is because of data. Even though marketing is so ubiquitous, it can be really difficult to measure um, from the food environment level all the way to purchasing changes to dietary changes. So one example that we wanted to highlight as somewhere that has done this really well, let's see, my, <laughs> okay, there we go, is Chile. Um, Chile implemented in 2016 a law of food labeling and marketing that is really considered to be one of the world's most comprehensive regulations. First, they put in this system of uh, front of package warning labels, but they also essentially banned marketing to kids, meaning that they took away different forms of child-directed marketing, but then in a second phase of the law, eliminated marketing on TV from 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. And then they also banned those same sets of foods that had labels and were banned from marketing from school. So it was a really comprehensive total package of policy, but the marketing regulation was particularly innovative. So one of the other things that was really cool about Chile's policy is that there was really comprehensive data collected from the food environment to behavioral changes to dietary intake, and even measuring the types of advertisements kids were seeing on TV. So here is an example of what kinds of changes we saw after this policy was implemented on uh, breakfast cereals. So we saw a big reduction in the use of child-directed marketing on these types of sugary cereals, which you can see on these packages here. There was also a really big drop in children's um, advertising exposure. So before and after just the first phase of the law, so not even the part that banned 
all marketing from 6 a.m. to 10 p.m., we already saw a really big decline in advertising for this unhealthy food and especially big declines in what kids were seeing. And I'm not showing it here, but Melissa Jensen, who I think is on this webinar, has a couple of papers um, in press or in progress that show how these changes in food advertising are then linked to changes in children's diets, which is really exciting. Okay, so I just wanted to show some examples of what this looks like. Um, first, there were some kind of unintended consequences. So these here on the left were chocolate Santas that had the Santa's face removed um, because of the marketing law. And then there was also some really interesting kind of unintended consequences. Um, so here what we can see is prior to the law, all of these kid um, child-directed advertisements on processed meat. And then after the law, those shifted. So they're still advertising for processed meat, but it's no longer focused on kids. And so this is where thinking about methodological tools becomes really important because the industry and the structural changes we see in the food environment move very quickly, and we need to be able to keep up with those. Not depicted here are also many changes that are happening in the digital marketing environment. Coke is another great example that Anna Clara already talked about, where there was really heavy um, child-directed advertising before the law. And after the law, that went away. But what happened is, it's hard to see, but these kids now are still being featured in the advertising, but it's actually for Coke Zero or Coke Light. So these are, again, some examples of what we need to be aware of. So in terms of thinking about priorities um, for the future, it's really thinking about how do we measure the impact of food marketing to kids across all of these different platforms and taking care to measure all of the different uh, ways that this exposure can manifest itself. Okay, that is it. We'd like to acknowledge our collaborators and I'll turn it back to Encore. Thank you so much. Thank you to all of our panelists, Abby, Olga Lucia, Maria Alejandra, Ana Clara, and Lindsay for some fantastic presentations. Now it's time for our Q&A, and we've already had several questions come in here, but I want to um, encourage anyone with a question to please put it in the Q&A. Even if we don't have time to get to all of your questions today, we will ask our panelists if they're able to respond, and we can send those responses out to you after the webinar. So please do put your questions in, and we'll get to all that we can today. Uh, there were several questions already about our voice, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give those to Abby to respond to in just a moment. Um, several people were asking about who can use it and whether or not it has been used by any Native communities in the U.S. and whether there are any lessons learned that you could share. So, Abby? Yeah, thanks, Karen. Great questions. Thanks so much. Um, in terms of use, you know, our, our goal is to spread our voice around the planet and to get as many people empowered to, um, you know, collect their own data, interpret it and use it to better their environments and their communities. Um, we're particularly interested in underserved communities that have not been reached. Um, and I think the native um, communities are an excellent example of that. And we're very excited that we're just now launching several um, projects with um, American Indian populations. Um, one is in partnership with the North Dakota State University people, um, particularly their Department of Public Health and their extension um, program. And it's titled, I'll just read you the title, it's Promoting Healthy Outcomes through indigenous food systems. And so we're working as part of that project in partnership with North Dakota, and in particular with the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe and the Turtle Mountain Band of Chippewa. And uh, we are very excited to just start that. So we don't have any lessons learned, yes, but I know that yet, but I know that we will have a number of them. And we also have a, a new postdoctoral fellow, Maya Pedersen, um, joining us who has been funded by the National Cancer Institute to specifically look at our voice in American Indian and Alaska Native communities. So there'll be lots of learnings coming down the pike. So please stay in touch with us. <laughs> keep, keep in touch with us. Um, get onto our website. 
um, send your questions there and your connections there. We have a place for people to connect um, with us. It's just um, ourvoice.stanford.edu. And we would love to connect and potentially partner with people. Thank you. Thank you. We've got a question in the Q&A for Lindsay. Um, someone is asking, what is the policy for the US? Um, because uh, she was thinking that the policy here was no children in marketing for unhealthy foods. So Lindsay, could you address that? Yeah, sure. So currently there is no statutory policy in the US relating to unhealthy food marketing. Um, a while ago, a number of years, I, I can't remember, I want to say 15 years ago, um, there was a voluntary pledge um, called the Children's Food and Beverage Advertising Initiative that where a bunch of companies came together and said that they wanted to stop reducing unhealthy foods to kids. But the evaluation of that program largely showed that it didn't have very much impact. And that's primarily because these voluntary pledges have really limited scope in the way that they define um, unhealthy food marketing to kids. So it's not like we see a removal of those cartoon characters on cereal boxes or cartoon characters on junk food, all the things that we know make kids reach out and want, you know, tell their parents they want those products. That has not happened here the same way it has happened in, in Chile and elsewhere. Okay, thank you. I think we have time for one or two more questions uh, live during the webinar here. Let me go next to Ana Clara and I want to ask you to answer the question, how do we go ahead with school food system and food environment related studies during the closure of schools because of the current pandemic? And that's a great question. Um, in fact, uh, we have just finished working on mapping what has been done during the pandemic for many countries in Latin America. And uh, turns out m many of them have either changed, uh, adapted the policy, not for kids to keep receiving the foods, the school meals during the pandemic, but in many of them, like the, the quality of the meals have decreased. Um, also, when I'm talking about food systems, uh, in Brazil, for instance, the school feeding, school feeding program um, says that 30% of all the foods must be purchased from local farmers. Uh, what happened is, which it has potentially a good impact on the food system and definitely on their livelihoods, but what happened is like many of the cities just stopped buying from them and they lost their, um, their crops and stuff. So um, yes, that's a very good question. And I'm also aware that Researchers have been mapping what's been going on in the United States during the pandemic about the school feeding program. And the, I think the future questions for us, all of us to answer is, well, how, what would be the, the consequence of all this time kids were out of school? Okay, thank you. I know we've had several questions both in the chat and in the Q&A regarding the most up-to-date statistics on childhood obesity and, uh, and some other things that people have requested. We will try to get those out to you or some, some links out to you when we respond. Um, there is also, of course, the supplement. Uh, you can see the link for that in the chat right now um, for further information. And I think that may be all of the the questions that we have time for live right now, um, but we will try to respond to all of the questions we received uh, after the webinar. So you can look for an email from us there. Um, we would now like to, uh, to say thank you again to our panelists and move on to, um, to make several announcements uh, with other good information for all of the attendees today. Um, First, I wanted to let you know that NCORE has translated the Youth Compendium of Physical Activities into Spanish, and you can find that at the link in the chat. So I hope you will look for that. We also have recently updated the NCORE Measures Registry with over 250 new articles, and more than 25 of those are in Spanish as well. If you are a student, we would like to encourage you to be sure to sign up for the Student Hub newsletter. And you can also check out NCORE's Student Hub webpage. You'll find that at uh, www.ncore.org 
forward slash student hyphen hub forward slash and you can see that link in the chat and on the screen as well. If you have used or plan to use any of NCORE's tools, including the resources that we've discussed today, please make sure to let us know. You can email us at NCORE at FHI360.org. That's NCORE, N-C-C-O-R, at FHI, Frank Harry Iceberg, <laughs> 360.org. Um, so, um, please do email us and you could end up actually being a featured speaker on one of our future webinars. If you have any questions about NCOR or about NCOR's upcoming activities, please email the NCOR Coordinating Center. You can, uh, again, reach us at the same email address, NCOR at FHI360.org. In the coming days, this webinar will be archived along with part one of the webinar on the NCORE website. And you can find that by going to the webinars tab on the website. I wanna say thank you again to our speakers for this outstanding webinar and thanks to all of you who attended. Before you sign off, we are gonna be putting a brief survey on the screen. You can do it right on the screen and it will really help us to shape future webinars. So please take a moment to answer those questions now. We're going to switch over to that feedback form right now and you can write your input directly on the screen and hit submit. Thanks again to all of our panelists and attendees and I hope you have a good afternoon and we will see you at a future InCore webinar. Thank you. Bye-bye.